Staff Sergeant Larry Joe Powell, United States Army, Vietnam. I interviewed Larry in Brenham, Texas, Washington County, Texas. I was putting together a film featuring veterans from that area, and this was 2010. I interviewed him January 8, 2010. On Veterans Day that year, we premiered that film in Brenham. It's just 2,000 people, standing room only. It was just so successful. But Larry Joe Powell is one of my veterans featured in that film, Lest They Be Forgotten, Texas. It's on my website. You can order it from the Honor Store. But anyways, Larry Joe was 66 when I interviewed him 13 years ago. He's probably 79 now, and I believe he's still with us. Just a great interview. Another one of these fantastic perspectives of Vietnam through his eyes and ears, and really happy to share his story today. He served with the 4th Infantry Division. Their motto was steadfast and loyal. He was a staff sergeant, like I said, and he served in 68 and late 69. In December of 69, he, he left Vietnam. But he was uh, 11 Bravo. He, he saw it all. He was front lines and uh, he'll tell the story to you. So it's just an incredible opportunity to learn more about Vietnam. I want to thank Michael and Darlene Sarovsky in Denver. They are supporters of my work. God bless you guys. Thank you for your support and making it possible for others to hear and to learn the history here. As there's people in this country trying to erase history, Voices of History is here to make sure it doesn't get erased. This is such an important part of our history. 21 years ago I started my work in Arizona and I'm going back there in January to interview more Vietnam vets. So if you're in the listening area, if you're not and you want to sponsor a veteran down in Arizona, please get a hold of me. It's going to be a trip I'm going to make from Grand Junction, Colorado. I'm going to drive down there in January and I need some support. I need some help with that. That would be greatly appreciated. And if you want to get involved with that, just get a hold of me. And um, but folks, my heart's full. Darlene and Michael, thank you, like I said, for making it possible for others to hear Larry's story today and all the stories you've helped me with. God bless you guys, and I appreciate you greatly. I would encourage those of you watching these stories and listening to the radio station, Voices of History Radio, KBOH, 24 hours a day, to get involved, folks. And I've said it before, I don't run any commercials on these stories. I think it's disrespectful, the interrupted with a commercial, I just, I don't like that, that's, that's me. But I don't like that, so I don't, I don't uh, give that to you also. I don't give you those commercials, I don't want them. But um, you know, this is listener supported, so your help would be greatly appreciated. If you'd like to donate to this project, you can do so by just contacting me through my uh, website, larrycapetto.com, email me. There's information in the video description in the comment section of this video about how to donate to this work and I would really appreciate you thinking and considering to doing that for the radio station and for this uh, video channel Voice of History on YouTube so I would really really appreciate that so just um, I'll leave it at that but it, it would be greatly appreciated so folks thank you for watching and listening to these stories and subscribing to this channel and sharing these videos and I'm just so happy to share Larry Powell's story with you. It's, uh, like I said, he's featured in my 11th film, I believe his 11th film, Lest It Be Forgotten, Texas. And now we can hear his complete unedited story here. So he was 19 when he enlisted into the, the Army in 1963. So when he went to Vietnam, he's in his early 20s and uh, came back home to tell the story. And you're going to hear it now. God bless you. Thank you for watching. Reserves and How old are you now, Larry? 66. Did you ever think you'd be 66? Someone asked me the other day how to feel, and I, I don't know, and they've been 66, so. Young 66, how's that? That's good. Yeah. What, what year did you go in the military? 63. Were you drafted? No, I just went in. I was a, went in 63 boot camp. Why did you want to join the military? Just, I just thought I'd love it. Family history of military? I think I was about the only one ever went to military, actually. So did you even know what the word Vietnam meant in 63? Did you ever hear it? Not at that point in time, no, sir. So where'd you go to basic training? Fort Leonard, Missouri. Were you trained in the infantry? or? I would start out in, in, in uh, 
like a S4, which is supplies. Mm -hmm. And then I went to a kind of a recon type of school. Anyway, and I became a 11 Bravo, which is infantry. Mm -hmm. And then when I went overseas, I was a 11 Bravo infantry. So early 60s, I mean, the country really knows nothing really about Vietnam at that point. At what point did you start hearing about Vietnam? You might go to Vietnam, 64, 65? About 65. I had a friend of mine went over at that point in time. And then um, I didn't go over until late part of 68. What did you do between 64 and 68? I was uh, showing quarter horses and stuff, mess with the horse business. But you were in the military? I was in, yeah. So you were still in the States? Right. Where were you, where were you stationed at? I went to, uh, this far I went overseas was at Fort Carson. Colorado? Yes, sir. Well, I'm from Colorado. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So your MOS is the infantry, and you're, are you a sergeant at this time? Or? I was, uh, I made staff sergeant in Vietnam. I was an E-5, or when I went over, I mean, I made E-6 when I was over in Vietnam. Did you have a family at that time? No, sir. So no, sir. Still single? And tell me about getting orders to go to Vietnam, where you were, and... and Walk me through that. Well, my water, uh, orders came down when I was in Fort Carson. That's where we took all the, uh, I guess they used to call it the jungle training. We had all the training in Colorado Springs. And um, orders came down in November of 68 that I was going to be shipped over. And uh, of course I went over and then, uh, then I, uh, with my MOS and intelligence operation also, together information slash I was also infantry of course. Um, I had a colonel that uh, I had a six-man squad including myself. We were stationed up around Play Cool which is a central highland area and um, we used to gather information up between Play Cool and Cambodia border. We used to work in that area and um, I had I had five good young men under me and um, so that's what we did. We just gather information and things like that, and uh, kind of we move around with a convoy sometimes, and um, we stay we stay here, stay you know different little places we stay you know. So it was, uh, but I had some good young men with me. Uh, so when you first went to Vietnam, what did you experience as far as the geography, the weather? I mean, what do you remember coming in country the first time? Well, it's it was hot, of course. And uh, I don't know, it, it was a smell that, that, that I always remember. Um, it, it, you know, when you go through little villages or towns, it, you know, things like that. And it just, uh, just it was just a, kind of a mess, to me, you know, the way it looked and everything. Uh, but, um, so were you assigned to a company, a, I was a division, with, a regiment? I was with the 4th Infantry Division is who I served with. I was with the 1st 14th Infantry. And you were a sergeant? I was staff. I, I made staff, which is an E6. Staff sergeant, so you had a, a platoon or a squad? I, I just had a, a squad, six of us, including myself. You had two tours of Vietnam? Or just one? one. So from 68 to 69? To December 69 when I finally got out. Can you just tell me a little bit about your experience in Vietnam, any combat you had, and, and are you fighting the Viet Cong or the North Vietnamese or both? We, we had both. We had the VC and also the NVA. Um, uh, you know, we took fire once in a while. Um, there was sniper fire, you know, they, they do that all the time. And especially at fire bases, they kind of do that off and on during the night to keep bringing rounds on top, you know. But then, uh, later part of 69, we was at a little fire base, they called Fire Base St. George. And I just, I took my men in that night just to sleep that evening, you know. And, uh, and then about, <clears throat> in about a quarter to one, we got hit. Um, I, in fact, I decided to get off the ground, so I had four of my men and myself. We were sleeping in the back of a deuce and a half. My other two young men was underneath it, sleeping on the ground when the stuff hit us. And it, it took the cameras a little bit off the top of that truck. And uh, I hollered at my boys, we didn't mean to get out of this truck. So we hit the ground, and um, by that time, it was really getting heavy on us. But I didn't know at the time that we was getting overran at the time. And so I got my men gathered up. I had four of them stay back. Myself, I had a young man that was an Indian that 
he does it points and operates the 60 for me and everything. And he, I told him to take the right flank, and I and noticed I heard some something like a crying. And uh, <clears throat> I told the Indian, I said, you, you on me, let's go. So we got to this young guy, and he was hit real bad, real bad. And the only thing I could get out of him was there was three of them. And I said, I'll get you. I said, I'm going to get you back, get you some help. And he just kept saying, Sarge, you watch it, it's three. Well, I get him back to the medics where they was dubbed in. And they go, you know, I went back out. I went, I told my man to go one way and I go the other. And then I heard some, I heard three shots from a 38. I mean, a shot from 38. I, I was authorized to carry a handgun over there as a backup piece. And my, that Indian I had on me, he also carried one. And I heard six shots is what I actually heard. And I hollered at him. I get to him, and he said, there's three of them. Well, there's that three again. Well, from here to that wall, maybe six, seven foot, there was three NBA. They call them sappers. Their job is to crawl through the wire, set charges, and then get back out. That's what they do. They didn't carry weapons. But, but the other firepower is coming from about 200 yards or better. So uh, <clears throat> anyway, we had three NBA laying there. So anyway, all night long we got hit, and um, we finally got some air support around 2 o'clock or 2.30 or whatever it was, and they start uh, hitting from the air on them. And uh, it went all night until about sun up. And uh, I put my men around to secure the uh, medical to keep, keep them, try to keep them safe as possible and stuff like that, and then we... Uh, when the choppers finally start coming in inside the wire on us, I was in charge of loading all the injuries on the chopper under fire. They was firing at us, trying, we was trying to get them out of there. And we only could carry, they only could carry four at a time. So after the sun came up, we had, we had nine young men dead. We had 31 injured at that time. And, uh, but we also had, we had, uh, Miss a minute. That's fine. Take your time. Um, <clears throat> we also had 40 NVA that was dead inside the wire on us, and um, so and then um, anyway, we st you know we, we was trying to get things lined back out and get ourselves prepared again to get hit. Well, we had received information that there was a NVA unit in that area, and we may get hit. We got that information from a mountain yard uh, chief. That we and um, we sh he was right. And um, anyway, we had we had like I said, we had forty NVA inside the wire. They were dressed in the little, you know, black silks. So we took care of all that. And then later on, we had an engineer, a uh, trucking outfit, come out to check his vehicle that was hit. We had one more that was still alive up underneath the truck. We had to get him out underneath the truck. So it was a long night. Um, there's a lot of young men that, uh, but he got hit. Was some of these men from your squad? No, no. All my people came out all right. Um, we was all right. Were you carrying an M16 or? No, I was. Only thing I really carried was a. It's an M79. The sling wood was a bloop gun. It's used a little, um, like a little grenade type of round. Grenade launcher? It's like a little grenade launcher. You open it's about that long. And you just open up, you put one round in it, and you close it. And about a hundred yards, I guess, you can shoot like a rifle. Or you can elevate it and drop it big round in it. And it explodes up. So. And of course I carry my thirty eight with me. I carry documents and you know, stuff like that like also. And uh but only thing I had signed out to me was an M sixty. That's the only thing I had my name on, you know, actually, but Anyway, um, we got hit hard. Uh, was this the worst combat you had? That was, yeah. This is the toughest That's, part. That was the toughest part. You know, we took, we took rounds, you know, before stuff, but, you know, when you get overran and they get inside that wire on top of you, you know. So this is the first combat you've ever had in, it was in Vietnam. You didn't yeah, have no, sir. Stuff. That's the first one. So, I mean, I've heard at times when you're young, you're bulletproof, you feel bulletproof or invincible. Did you ever feel like that? No, sir. No, I, no, not really. Uh, like I told my people after it was over, you know, we was 
I make sure all my people are all right. And, uh, you know, it just, when that young man kept saying there was three of them, the Lord was with us. Because, I mean, I crawled up on them, and I, I didn't know it. And that's what he kept trying to tell me. But, you know, of course, and of course they didn't carry the weapons either. They just carried the charges to blow up everything they could blow up. And, uh, no, no, I had some, like I said before, uh, I had some good young men under me, and uh, and uh, in fact, I had a we had a thirty year reunion in ninety nine. We all got back together in Las Vegas, and uh, we stay in contact. You know, every every year now we Christmas time. And have you ever been to the Vietnam Wall? I never been to the main one. Um, only one I've been to is when Texas A and M. Brought a, almost a full size one over to A and M, and I went over there. You think you'd ever want to go back to D.C. and see that memorial? I always wanted to see the the main wall, and my squad and we've been talking about maybe we could have a our next reunion is maybe we can have it in Washington D.C. I don't know yet, but we're working on it. And uh, in, in my Vietnam film, I took some Vietnam vets back to the wall, and we did a, a video, like a music video, to a John Fogarty song. Oh, okay. And it really meant a lot because they'd never been there, so you know. And after forty years, it's still very, very emotional. I'm sure you know some of the names on the wall. I know some of them, yes, sir. Uh, the gentleman I told you that went over in '65, he uh, he got hit and got killed, and uh, yeah, I know I know some of them on the wall, yes, sir. Is it hard to talk about these things? I mean, do you, did you talk about the war when you came home? No, I didn't. No, I, the only time I talked to him, if there's another vet, we, you know, another vet, that's a little different. But I don't say too much about it. But uh, now you showed me your shadow box. There's a bronze star in there with a V. What's the V for? V stands for heroism in ground combat. Okay, was this the incident maybe where you got the bronze star? when we got overran that night? Yeah. Yes, sir. Now you, you did you call in the choppers the next day? Did you say to come in or that no, night? No, no, that night they they start coming in around two two thirty something like that. We got air support, mm -hmm. and they start hitting the uh, hitting from the air, and then you had said you had uh, um, uh, I don't know, the Apaches. I forget. Well, what are the, we, we we had some slicks with yeah. the magic dragon they used to call it with the meaning that shoots a lot of rounds off. You had the attack ships, and then the the, the medevac. Yeah, the medevac came in behind them to, and uh, yeah they. They would shoot a flare up and light the place up, and then they come in, and then the slicks come down to uh, get the injured uh, soldiers out of there. Did you have to pop smoke? Yeah, we oh yeah, we pop smoke, um, get lighted up a little bit and everything. But uh, yeah, we we I know we ran out of we get close out of ammo too, and they they came in and dropped some down to us too. Also, uh, like I said, they went from. Close to one in the morning, the, the sun came up. It was four or five hours, whatever it was. Um, nothing but fire. Well, what, uh, hap what happened after this incident? Did you were you? What, when did you leave Vietnam? What, what? I left. I left a little about a month later, I guess it was, when my time was actually up. And uh, did you have a choice to go back, or is that it? I mean, you wanted. To go no, back. no. I, I had a, you know, I had a choice to, uh, you know, to re up and whatever. But I decided to. I you know I just decided I don't need them more right now. So, but then later on I start and then I joined the guards because they was wanting prior service people from Vietnam, and uh, so I went back in and uh, they said they had a program they called Try One. You can come in for a year and they're gonna bring you a rank higher. Okay, so I decided to go in. It was an infantry unit, so I went back down and told them I'd be interested. So. They brought me as an E-7, which is a sergeant first class. And I stayed up there, and then I moved to Texas, of course. And then uh, then I got in the state guards down here, and then I finally made, I went up to a command sergeant major. That's the uh, highest NCO rank you can get in the Army. So anyway, it just, all together, I, I spent a lot of time. Well, you know, I know you won't say you're a hero. To me, you are. But I mean, you show me all the accommodations and things you've done. But do you, do you ever feel like you're a hero? No, sir. No, the heroes are the young men that we lost a lot, a lot of young men. And uh, no, I just happened to be there. And why? Why did you survive? Well, what I tell people, I just I guess a good, a good Lord was with me, and I didn't. Um, everything went my way, and I didn't get hit. 
what got you through the hard times? I mean, I know you're trained, but did you have faith in God? I mean, how did you get through yeah, the hard times? Yeah, I, I had faith with him and, I, and, I, and, the, uh, and the young men that I have with me, you know, we, we used to sit out at night, you know, we talk, and uh, we got real close. Um, yeah, I was a sergeant, but also I know all them young men can say, cover my back, and I got theirs. Tell me about the camaraderie. I mean, obviously you guys are close. I mean, you're a sergeant, but still. I, mean, uh, uh, men. I slept with them. I ate with them. And I know when I, I know I, I went back to the main area and played cool. It was Campanari where we was out of. And I used to get out in a big mess hall with them. And I, the first time I went back, the first sergeant comes along and says, uh, Sergeant, what's that sign say back on that door? I said, Senior NCOs. That's what you eat when you come back. I said, well, I'm about finished eating top. I said, uh, I'll remember that next time. It was never next time. I, I stayed with my people. And uh, we, got, we, we was real tight. Um, it's just like when I had that reunion. Mm -hmm. It seemed like we had a 30-day leave. Then we all got back together again. And uh, we was real close. Uh, I know it, it, it impressed my wife how much respect them guys had for me. And, uh, but anyway, it was, I, we was close. We were close. Uh, well, when you came back home, you were still in the military, so you probably didn't have the experience a lot of guys had coming home. I mean, they were spit on and, you know, a lot of bad things were said about him. Or did you see some of that? Or Well, I don't know I don't know what you printed or not, but, I had a little. I had a run in at L.A. Airport. Okay. okay. Tell me about it. I was fully dressed. You know, I had my greens on with my medals and everything on. I was. I had a five five hour layover in L.A. before I could fly back home, and I was just walking around. I had two young men come approaching me, and they had the army shirt, you know, fatigue shirts cut off with the piece on them, you know, had all the beads around them, and as I just cleared them. They popped off and said, look at that little soldier with all the blankety blank on his chest. And it, it, it didn't sit with me. And I turned around and I explained it to him. I, I mean, it wasn't nothing to do, I shouldn't have done it, but it just hit me just wrong, you know. Um, when they, especially when they cussed what I got on my shirt, on my uniform. And then one of my boys in the squad, he did get spit on at the airport in New York or Chicago, I can't remember where. And the uh, city officers came in there, and, but he didn't appreciate it either. But a lot of soldiers got spit on. We were baby killers, you know. We shoot women, babies. We went through all that, you know. And some people seen more than I did. I might see more than somebody else said, I don't know, but we all did our jobs. And. Uh, I think you read that letter I got from that young man overseas right now with that respect. He sent me that flag. and uh, But no, it was, it wasn't the best. It was tough when you came back. They look at you funny and, you know, things like that. But you just got to keep going, you know. What would you say to a Vietnam vet who might be watching this who maybe had that experience and maybe is still bitter all these years later? What would you say to a Vietnam vet today? I, it just, um, when I had my experience, I just let it roll off me, and I'm a man, and I just, I know what I did. Uh, I'm not ashamed of it. When you're, when you're in combat, is there fear? I know that sounds kind of silly. Is, or does is the fear come after the combat? No, you always have, you know, you always think, you know. You know, if you say, you know, if you say you wasn't scared or you didn't have fear, it ain't true. I mean, even in my law enforcement, you get a call and you think in your mind how you go approach it. I mean, yeah, you know, you, no, if somebody says they wasn't scared, or something, no, I don't go along with that. Um, you know, it's not a shame to be scared. I mean, you know, the way I look at it, um, you, I just hope you can get it done and come back all right. How close did you get to the enemy? At any did you get close like this or were they always at a distance when you were in, in Vietnam? No, they, were, they usually stay at a distance when they, when they uh, 
brought shot until that one. And then we got close to me and you. You know, you know, there was some of them, some of the officers, I mean, some of the young troops actually hand to hand with them. Uh, that was how close it was. Did you guys fix bayonets, or how do you train to do that? No, they did. We all hardly ever fix bayonets. They, 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 most soldiers always carry some type, you know, bayonet on them and some type of knife. I had a K bar knife that I always carried on me that I carried it upside down and uh, things like that. But uh, yeah, a lot of them got hand to hand on some of it. And of course, the choppers got to get so close to the Constantina wire, and uh, it was. It was tight. Yeah. Um, yeah, we. In fact, the next morning we had a ceremony of. Uh, we had nine pair of boots sitting in formation, and uh, had a ceremony about nine that uh, got killed that night. And I really don't know how many left. I know some of them probably died, uh, passed away after. But there's a lot of them hit real bad. And that young man, that, that first one that I got to was, uh, I don't know if he made it or not. I can't, you know, I knew, I just knew him a short time. I didn't really know him that well, but he kept trying to tell me, though. But, uh... So did you, did you use the Huey helicopters much for transport during your time? I Vietnam? had, yeah, I, I had a few flights with them, um, on them. Uh, especially when I'm moving, doc when I go, they, they may send me by myself to pick up documents, and they fly me one base to the next, to the next far base and stuff like that, and, uh, so I had a few hours, you know, not like some of them. Well, when you think but, of Vietnam, the sound of the blade, I mean, that certainly tells a lot about Vietnam. You, you, you never forget the sound that they make. they got a sound to them, and you can hear them coming. Uh, no, that's the best sound you can hear if you're really taking fire. So you know you got help coming. And, uh, yeah, they make their own, they got their own sound. I can hear them go by the house. Because I'm in the flight pattern from Fort Hood to, to Houston or whatever they they come on my farm quite a bit and I can I can hear them way off. Does that kind of bring it back? Yeah, every time I hear a chopper, I say, man, that's a that's a beautiful sound. To, my, to me, it's a beautiful sound because you know you got some you got some air support coming in on you. But yeah, I never get the sound of the I never got the sound of the AK 47s. I mean, they all sound different, you know. But Anyway, I had a the main thing. I had I really had some good young men under me, and uh, they, you know, they took care of me, and and I, I took care of them best I could take. You know, get we're, we're tight. We're, other people don't understand. You know, you become brothers. It's like that movie they called Band of Brothers. I think it was, but you become your family. I don't care if it's been forty years or. You stay in touch with any of these guys? I talk to every one of them at Christmas. Do you? You call them? I was going to call them, but I had one of the young men, he lives in California, a young man, but I came back from the bar and my wife said, Dennis called me, Dennis Battles. So I called him and we talked for a while. And then I called Dennis and uh, Dennis Summerfield up in St. Louis. Then I talked to uh, Eddie Belmar in Virginia. And Smitty uh, Smith up in Nebraska, and my, my my Indian lives over here in Amarillo, and we always been tight. Uh, I knew he came back all right, because he came to visit me after I came home and after he got out. The rest of my one for sure if they uh, if they came back or not. Um, but then I went, I belonged to Fourth Infantry, and I went to a reunion at Fort Hood when they was, and I found out I could try to locate them. So my wife. Uh, only thing I had was the first and last names of what state they're from. That's all I had. But she found every one on Sunday afternoon, and I, I called each one. And uh, I know the first one. I told my wife, I said, I don't know what to say to him. Just talk to him. Okay. So I called Lady Anson. I asked for. I said, Can I speak to Eddie? Yeah, he's right here. And, and he came on the phone. I said, Eddie, yeah. I said, Let me ask you something. You remember the old road runner? That was my nickname. He said, I'll be blank, uh, my old Sarge. Now, I got them all that afternoon. I found them all. Mm. And then that's when we decided to have a, they want to have a reunion, so we did. But 
Some of those accommodations and citations on the floor there, I mean, I don't want you to pick those up, but can you just briefly tell me what you have down there again? Uh, there one citation I got is the, um, the Bronze Star mm -hmm. with the V for heroism and ground combat. Do, when it, we got overran, it um, says something like, uh, you, you had to be put in it, that I kept exposed myself under constant empty fire and stuff like that. Um, then I got the Army Combination Medal over here that uh, I also was in counter surgery, like um, it's intelligent operation, gathering intelligence. So I got that. Of course, I got the uh, one of the oldest awards they have is the Combat Entry Badge. And uh, I don't know how it is now. It used to be infantry and special forces. The only one can be awarded that the blue the rifle with a reef on it. And um, but um, that's the main two that I got. And then you I got, served in law enforcement for thirty some years. Did that career parallel with all your experiences in Vietnam? Uh, yeah, it's it, it's. Um, I think yes, I did. Um, I came back in '69, of course, and then I got in law enforcement in the middle of '70s. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, I spent 36 years in it. I did. I'll be retired four years in May. You were the and, sheriff of a county, or no? I, I I was I I was chief of police in a small town, okay. and then uh, I came to Brenham in '83, mm -hmm. and I decided to retire in 2001. But the sheriff the sheriff here in this county is also a Vietnam vet, mm -hmm. and he's a good friend of mine. And he called me, wonder what I was going to do, and I told him I don't know, but he wanted me to come over there for a while. So 30 days later, I'm back in law enforcement, and I put four and a half years at the at the Washington County SO. So did you ever have to draw your weapon? Oh, I have, you know, it's been drawn a lot, of, yeah. Yes, sir. Um, but the last 25 years or so, I was in strictly worked uh, investigation, criminal investigation is what I've done. But, uh, yeah. But, I'm not trying to make a comparison necessarily, but I've, I've worked in law enforcement too, and I've interviewed a lot of veterans over the years, but, um, and both careers kind of overlap each other, as it were. Well, police, you know, police police department or sheriff, you know, it's kind of, a, it's a semi-military mm -hmm. back, background, you know, I mean, operation. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's, it's, uh, it's about like a military, uh, you know, you got your, uh, you got your rank, Things like that, and, and you laid out like that, and uh, and I th my my military helped me to be uh, my I think it really helped me in my uh, being a peace officer. Um, but would you rather just forget about Vietnam, or you can't ever get away from that? I mean, no, I'm not. No I, experience. I'm not, no. I like I tell some other people. You know, I had good I, we had good times, mm -hmm. and it goes those bad times. That's just, that's what we you know. Um, but um, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't change it. You know, I wouldn't change it. You know, yeah. uh, no, no, I wouldn't. I never forget it. And I, you know, I know some of them really had a real bad time of it with it, and uh, and it's probably still do. But I got over, you know, over it. And but no, I wouldn't change it. I, I mean, I wouldn't change none of it. I had, like I said, I met some good young people and. We had some good times, of course. We had some other times, but uh, tell, tell what do you think our country has, lear has learned from Vietnam? Have we learned anything from the Vietnam War? What should we remember? Uh, about it? Ah, man, I don't get into that much. Um, well, I'm not looking for a political I, answer. I'm I just know. Saying just I mean, here, let me let me say, I, I feel at least we've learned how to welcome our troops home now. Oh, well, at that point, That's yes. That's something we've learned. At that point, uh, yes. Um, the young uh, young troops that come home now, they're getting respect. You know, I think, I don't know, at one time they have a little parade or they have, you know, but they recognize them as being soldiers and and they've uh, done their job for the United States to protect and served. Some of them served with their lives. Yes, they showing uh I'm glad of that too. I'm glad of the respect that these young men and women are getting. And um, but I've even seen a lot of the Vietnam veterans getting the re attention they should have gotten then today. <laughs> we're getting yeah. It seems like we're getting more respect now. Even the Korean soldiers, you know, they didn't get exactly. much. They didn't get no respect when they came back. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's it's changing a little bit. 
Um, and I'm, I'm glad of that because, uh, you know, when you, you serve your country, you know, I don't care if it's uh, whatever, you know, like I told people, they always talk about Vietnam. I said, look, we did our job. Now these young people are doing theirs. That's all you can do. It's just You do what you can do. And uh, yeah, I'm glad, I really am glad when you brought that. That's, that's good because uh, I know there's a lot of young men that's over there and a lot of them that came back that have been hit and uh, and they get a lot of respect. Uh, of course, more than we did, we get nothing. But that's that's what it was. Let me ask you a question. Um, I I speak in schools, and I talk to kids about war and about freedom, and freedom not being free, and along those lines. And and I, I challenge them with the thought: they're born in a free country. You know, do you really give thought to why you're free and the freedoms we have and the sacrifices made? So. But you, Larry, as a veteran, what, what does freedom mean to you? Freedom is, uh, you know, um, you, you, you're free to, you know, to live your life, you, you know, and um, you get, we, got, we got so much things we can be thankful for being living in a free country. And uh, some of these people don't, like you said, they don't understand that. You know, we can go down the road and we go on vacation more we'll to, you know, we don't have no one saying we got to do this. And uh, the people that really don't understand it, you know, like I told them, you know, in my lifetime, we've never seen a war in this, in the United States. They don't understand what, what a war does to a country and or county. I don't care what it is. They got a little taste of it when they hit the New York City. How quick, you know, it can become a war zone, okay? A lot of people, I don't mean, even people my age or younger, we haven't ever seen a war in this country. And I try to tell them, I say, you know, they're over here, count on our people, and they use our equipment, you know. And freedom is a wonderful thing. And I, and I wish a lot of people would think about it. But like you said before, the, the soldiers, they lose their lives to keep us free. And, uh, and it's, but some of them just don't, uh, freedom is, you know, freedom is a wonderful thing. I mean, you know, we can do what we want. We can go down the road over there. You know, you would not have no communists tell you what you can do, how much you can make. It is, freedom is, is everything to me. Uh, and my grandkids coming up, and I hope everything's, uh, I know it's, it, I hope they can enjoy it, and uh, freedom, because it's, hmm. Tell me about the American flag, Larry. What does the American flag mean and represent to you as a veteran? The American flag is uh, the young people that uh, we serve for our country. We serve that color. The American flag is uh, it's uh, I respect it. You had to you respect your colors, your flags. You've been in a lot of wars to keep us free, and it uh, it withstood a lot of. A lot of combat, and he's still flying free. Um, <clears throat> and I, you know, it, it upsets me when people just disgrace the flags, or and a lot of people don't know actually what the uh, what the flag represents. In my opinion, um, but uh, but it's, I think it's, it was getting better that you know after we got. You see a lot of flags flying now that they used to see, but uh, the flag is, you respect your colors. Like I said, a lot of young people lost their life with it, and uh, it's been, it, it withstood a lot of fire fights and wars, and it's still flying. What does Veterans Day mean to you? Is that a special day for you? Yes, sir. Um, it's, it's when you get know. I participate in a lot of veterans deal here in in Washington County. Myself and uh, Ben Seeker, he's he's real heavy in the and uh, it's a time to, to respect the ones that before you and after you and uh, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's a special day for me where you can get together with uh, other tr gentlemen or ladies and uh, but. Uh, and we, I have to say, Washington County is pretty good with veterans programs. 
they're in, I think they're about every school we got. Okay, and uh, which is, and I used, to, I have spoken to the different schools before, but uh, that's one thing I can say about Washington County. They really, uh, of course, now they got a plaza we have now for the all the vets. I mean, you know, and uh, they got that up several years ago, and uh, but they they really uh, do a lot of things for the vets around here, programs and all the schools, which I I think that's great, and. Uh, are you proud to be a Vietnam veteran? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, can't take it away from me. Yep. How, how does it feel when people thank you? And I hope they do thank you. Um, they make me feel good. Um, real short story is when I got together with my people in Las Vegas, I had ball caps made up and I had road runners on it, Vietnam. 30 reunion, Golden Dragons. I gave my people, each one of my troops, I gave them a ball cap to wear. And you wouldn't believe how many people in Las Vegas that came up and it really uh, impressed us. I mean, they come up to, what's the Roadrunners? Of course, one of my men would say, that's our sergeant's nickname. And uh, shake hands and uh, thank you for serving. And it, it it makes you feel, you know, it makes you feel real good. I mean, it it was just amazing how they were in Las Vegas when they saw the ball cap and asked questions about it. And uh, we, you know, one guy was talking and he said, "I tell you what, I'm going to do. You can, ha you and your wives can have a free dinner on our, or you can go to one of our night, or nice shows at night. It's on us because you're a Vietnam vet." So we let the ladies choose what they want to do. And we went to one of them uh, musical things they have out there, you know, and they they took care of us. But that that really got us, they, they, they respect us to, they respect us that much to, to do something like for, for us. But When you left Vietnam, do you remember your last day in Vietnam before you went home? I was just waiting at the airport. Um, I mean, were you, were you wanting to leave, or did you want to leave your men, or how did you feel when you left? No, the only bad thing about it is I leave my young men. Uh, it was kind of hard on me. Uh, and, uh, of course, they was worried about who they're going to get now, you know, because they had a few more months to finish up. And they was concerned about who's our sergeant we're going to have now, you know. But uh, it, was, it, I, it, it was hard to leave those young men because I was with them so long. But uh, then we got back together after 30 years. It was, it was cool on that. Did you, did you carry one of those short-term calendars like the troops did, or did you, did you even mess with stuff like that? No, I, the only thing I really did, I had, a, I had an American flag that I kept, that I carried under my uh, fatigue shirts I carried with me. I still got it at the house. I, I carried a little American flag about, and I kept it folded up, and I carried it on, underneath my, yeah. I, I carried it everywhere with me. And, uh, I still got it at the house, put away. But I didn't get no counter or nothing like that. Uh, of course, I did have a short, what they call a short timer stick. I don't know if you're familiar with that or Bigly, not. Yes. And of course, when you get about a week or two left, a lot of guys will carry a stick, a certain, you know, whatever you want. And uh, to show that you get ready to come back to the world, you short timer, okay? And my boys got me one that was, it had a dragon head on it, it was a dragon unit. And then they had a, a shell put on it with my name on it and, and my nickname and what I used the time to do. I had a certain thing I always told them to bear down. That was just a saying I used to have, just bear down on them. And uh, so they gave that to me. And uh, I still got that, of course. But that's the only thing I, just a short time, and I, like I said, I did carry an American flag under my, with me all the time. Do you think it's important that we record these stories for history's sake and for our future generations? I think, yeah, I really think it's um, to get the, you know, to get the information out or the guys that served over there and what some of them went through. As I said before, some of them, they probably saw more than I did. I might saw more than they did. The bottom line is we served our country. We're going to end on that. At the end of my interviews, so though, we might want to get that. At the end of my interviews, I asked the veterans to give me a salute into the camera. 
when I ask you, from where you're seated, for the camera's sake, when I ask, if you see one of my films, you'll understand why I do this, but can I ask you when I tell you to give me a salute into the camera from there? Yes, sir. Give me a second here. Okay, Larry, when you look into the camera, give me a salute. Excellent, thank you.